Hello, and welcome to AIM International's preparatory tutorials for the Information Certification Exam. I'm Steve Weissman, Principal Consultant at Holly Group and a certified AIM training instructor in the realm of content, process, and information management. I'll be your guide as we review the exam's major domains of expertise, and I'll tell you all you need to know to earn that passing grade. Today's subject has to do with websites and portals, key parts of this special certification which AIM created to support you as you solve your organization's existing information-related problems and plan for its future. For 60 years, AIM has been the leading nonprofit association, helping users understand how to best manage documents, content, records, and business processes. Part of the Architecture and Systems Knowledge Domain, one of six within the certification program, this module will cover various means of accessing the Internet. For the most part, how most users access the Internet is a function of first availability and then cost. Here are some of the most common methods. Dial-up uses a modem and standard telephone line, which can be used either for calls or for interneting, but not both at the same time. The connection is made as needed and the maximum speed does not exceed 56 kilobytes per second, or kbps. ISDN, which is the Integrated Services Digital Network, also utilizes existing telephone lines but allows 64 kbps on a single channel. Two channels can be combined for a maximum of 128 kbps. DSL, for Digital Subscriber Line, also uses telephone lines, integrating regular phone service and internet access via a DSL hub so as to allow for an always connected situation in which voice calls don't interrupt data sessions. Download speeds can vary from 256 kbps to 6 megabits per second mbps, depending upon the level of service and the physical distance from the phone company's central office. Upload speeds are almost always much slower. Cable modems employ cable TV coaxial cables rather than traditional phone lines and require service from a cable TV provider. The connection to a computer is made by a network interface card NIC, NIC, and an Ethernet cable. Speeds here theoretically can reach 30 Mbps, but most providers offer service with between 1 and 6 Mbps for downloads, and between 128 and 768 Kbps for uploads, as the total bandwidth is divided among all the users in the given area. T1 lines are highly specialized telecommunications circuits that don't work over normal telephone lines. Popular in a large number of businesses for many years, they are divided into 24 channels that can be used for numerous purposes, but also can be combined to achieve a maximum speed of 1.54 Mbps. And finally, there are satellite connections, which are made by satellites orbiting the Earth. In this arrangement, each subscriber's hardware includes a satellite dish antenna and a transceiver, a transmitter and receiver combined, that operates in the microwave portion of the radio spectrum. Typical speeds are comparable to T1 lines for downloading, but are more similar to low-end DSL on the upload. Once connected to the Internet, the next step is to connect to the information management resources you need to access in order to accomplish the tasks of the day. There are a number of ways to accomplish this, including these. A virtual private network, or VPN, essentially forges a secure tunnel through the public Internet. It usually requires remote users to be authenticated and often calls for the use of data encryption as well to prevent disclosure of private information to unauthorized parties. Once connected, the VPN user experience is exactly that of a user directly hooked to the network in the office and supports any and all usual functions like file sharing, database lookup, and printing. Functionally, VPNs have eliminated the need to requisition and maintain expensive dedicated leased line telecommunications circuits, once typical of wide area network installations. Remote Desktop is a feature in high-end versions of Windows, XP Pro, Vista Business, Win7 Pro, and so forth, that allows a Windows computer to be run remotely from another Windows machine over any TCP IP connection, be it dial-up, LAN, or Internet. Also called Remote Desktop Connection, it uses the Remote Desktop Protocol, RDP, to exchange keystrokes, mouse movements, and screen changes. And finally, a Citrix server uses Microsoft Terminal Services software to deliver Windows applications to PCs, Apple computers, X terminals, and Unix workstations, where each device plays the role of a dumb terminal. 
This configuration enables users of those systems to access and use Windows programs. In recent years, the notion of remote access has shifted to one of mobile access to take advantage of the growing sophistication of smartphones and tablet computers. Classes of devices that both provide better internet access and browser-based web experiences today than their predecessors did. As this trend continues, mobile browsers will gain increased direct access to mobile hardware, including accelerometers and GPS chips, and the speed and abilities of browser-based applications will improve. Persistent storage and access to sophisticated browser graphical user interface functions also will appear, and the result will be an intensification of the emerging debate regarding browser-based and platform-specific native applications. About all that's certain is that both will continue onwards, as connecting in real time to enterprise servers is a long-established practice on the one hand, and gathering and analyzing data captured via electronic forms or direct input in areas without a reliable or even present connection is crucial in certain situations, on the other hand. Other issues to be sorted out include interoperability and usability, as multiple platforms, form factors, and interfaces still roam the marketscape. This makes it difficult for organizations to know which will be around for the long haul and thus what to invest in. The smartphone's relatively small size also is problematic for general purpose information management since display real estate is scarce and interaction with the screen requires a precision that can be tiresome. Finally, the penetration of the intranet into all corners of an organization is causing the lines between the topics just discussed to blur. For instance, if enabled by the system admin, a user logging onto her internal network can as seamlessly access a business partner's product catalog or project chat room as she can the public internet. In such a circumstance, the system itself could automatically establish a VPN to connect the two enterprises when the extranet is clicked, and it would matter to nobody if she ditched her company-issued ThinkPad in favor of an iPad. As the worlds draw inexorably together, and as technology continues to advance in terms of device processing power, availability of high-speed bandwidth, and cultural acceptance, the door will be flung even further wide open to Enterprise 2.0 and information workplace capabilities than it is today. These combine traditional corporate computing with new era social networking to create comprehensive and integrated user experiences and unlock opportunities to share knowledge and act on it. Some examples of the kind of content typically posted over each type of net are shown here. This module has covered various means of accessing the Internet. Having completed it, you may next wish to review the section on strategic planning. The material you have just reviewed is part of a broader program of study that prepares you to take the information certification exam. This proctored test consists of 100 multiple choice questions and is delivered electronically by Prometric. You'll have two hours to complete it, and upon passing, you'll earn a professional certification that's valid for three years. For more information, please visit www.aim.org slash certification. Thank you.